I thank all of our guests uh, for being here, and it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Well, thank you, Speaker. Well, in the spirit of the season, let me wish everybody as well here in the Chamber and across province a very Merry Christmas here, here. good health and happiness uh, in the new year. I take it that means we won't get a jobs plan as a Christmas gift. No. That sounds like the House isn't sitting next week, so I'm hoping for that. Um, I was hoping for that jobs plan. We still had a few days left. Now, I know the minute member for St. Catharines is trying to distract me here, so let me get to my question. Um, Premier, you're receiving today the Golden Panel, which we understand is going to increase gas tax in the province by five cents a litre. If you're a commuter filling up your tank a couple of times a week, if you're a family with two cars trying to get the kids to soccer and hockey, that's a, a punishing new tax increase. Um, I want to know, Premier, for the average commuter coming from Mississauga, from York Region, for Durham, how much is that going to impact their pocketbook on an annual basis? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as, uh, as the Leader of the Opposition knows, uh, Dr. Ann Golden will release her, uh, her report today, later today, and I certainly welcome this report because, Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the House are convinced that investing in infrastructure, including transit infrastructure, is absolutely necessary to the future economic health of this province, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that I understand that the opposition does not have a plan for funding transit, Mr. Speaker, does not have a commitment to building the kind of infrastructure that we know is needed in the GTHA and, quite frankly, beyond, Mr. Speaker. But we believe that those investments, along with investments in people and investments in a strong business climate, are what are needed, Mr. Speaker, in order for the economy to grow. And I look forward to receiving uh, Dr. Golden's report and continuing to uh, make those investments in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So I take it easy that, that, that you don't know you're not telling us uh, how much exactly a massive increase in the gas tax is going to cost average families, commuters uh, in the province of Ontario. See, Premier, I come from this from a very different place than you or the leader of the NDP. I believe taxpayers are already doing more than their fair share. The taxes are actually too high. You believe the taxes are not high enough. And Premier, I also believe that the top issue in our province is jobs. Actually, good jobs that you can count on, not the part-time or minimum wage jobs that you seem to be focused on in our province. And if you're making everything more expensive by putting gas taxes up, if you're taking money out of the pockets of Ontario families, isn't that actually going to make a very desperate job situation even worse in the province of Ontario? Should we be focusing on creating jobs and sparing our economy, not taking even more jobs and money out of the pockets of hardworking Ontario families? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's, you know, it's very interesting. The Leader of the Opposition never talks about the cost of not having transit, Mr. That's Speaker. Right, he never right. talks about the hours no and plan. hours wasted. He never talks about the cost of sitting in gridlock, Mr. Speaker. He never talks about the cost to businesses, about not being able to move their goods and services around, Mr. Speaker. He never talks about the quality of life, Mr. Speaker, that is uh, is uh, is diminished by having to sit in that gridlock, Mr. Speaker. So I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I look forward to receiving uh, Ann Golden's report. Uh, the Minister of Transportation is going to carefully review the, uh, the recommendations, Mr. Speaker, but we are determined to continue to build transit in the GTHA and to invest in infrastructure across this province. Answer. He does not have that determination, Mr. Speaker, and he does not have a plan to do so. Final supplementary. Well, no, no, I, 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 th I think the Premier is kidding around here a little bit. Uh, if you want to know what I'm determined to do, I'm determined to get our economy moving, create jobs and get taxes down in our province. But Premier, you, you and I have talked about this, right? I, we've sat in your office, we've talked across your desk, I've laid out my plan for transit. And I stand behind a proud history in the Ontario PC Party that has built 64 subway stations in the province of Ontario. And the Liberal count? Zero! In fact, Doug Holliday and I laid out this morning even more details of creating an Ontario Transportation Trust to put revenue there from prioritizing government spending as the economy grows, to sell off surplus landed buildings, to work in public-private partnerships, to put that money locked in for taxpayers so they know where it goes. I talked about this for over Question. a year, Premier, including with you personally. I'll build subways. I won't increase taxes. You'll increase taxes, and you never get anything done. I think our choice Thank is you. a military move. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Cena, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think it's terrific that the Leader of the Opposition has taken our idea of a trillium trust Perfect. and has now entrenched it in his plan, Mr. Speaker. I think that's great. Fantastic. And it is terrific, Mr. Speaker, that of late the Leader of the Opposition is talking about transit. But, Mr. Speaker, he talks about it as an un- funded plan. He has no plan to fund transit, Mr. Speaker. He simply talks about it like a nice, ethereal idea. The reality is we have a plan to fund it, Mr. Speaker. We understand that those investments in infrastructure and in transit are critical to the economic growth of the province, Mr. Speaker. There is no such plan coming forward from the Leader of the Opposition. The other reality is, Mr. Speaker, he talks about jobs, and yet we are trying to get Bill 105 passed, which now, would help 60,000 businesses, 60,000 small businesses in this province. It takes an idea from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business to help Answer. those payroll taxes. They are not supporting us, Mr. Speaker. We need their help to get Bill 105 passed. Very bad. Well, Premier, I mean, I, I think you're being a bit facetious here. Um, you and I have talked about this over a year ago. We laid out our plan over a year ago for an Ontario Transportation Trust. You stole that idea. You called it the Ontario Trillium Trust. Fair enough. I guess imitation is the best form of flattery. But here's the difference. We fund that by setting priorities, by doing public-private partnerships, by selling off excess land and buildings, and setting aside priorities in the capital budget, $13 billion a year. So that's how we fund it. How do you fund it? A punishing new gas tax on hard-working families in our province. I don't think we need to treat driving as some kind of sin. I don't think we need a new sin tax on driving, and in fact, that'll cost us jobs in the province of Ontario. So let me ask you a very clear question. If you think hydro rates can go up 60 percent, if you think it's okay to have that kind of waste at OPG, if you think it's okay to blow a billion dollars on gas plants in a question. province, and now you've got the gall to come back to increase gas by five cents a litre, just got to ask you, what planet are you living on that that is somehow okay? You see the choice? You see the place? Uh, before I... Before I... Uh, before I go to the Premier, I've tried to allow members to discipline themselves, even while I'm speaking, and to uh, ask members now, if, even if this is possibly the last day, I'll go back into the routine of, of the warnings. Discipline yourselves, please. Without the comments and the interjections, because now that's only raising my temperature. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition has not got the full story from the report. I ask him to read the report when, it, uh, when it's released today, Mr. Speaker. We will review the recommendations. We are determined to continue to invest in, uh, in transit, Mr. Speaker, and in infrastructure. And, you know, the Leader of the Opposition talks about what he would do. What he is on record as saying he would do is cancel the Hamilton LRT, cancel the Mississauga LRT, cancel the York Rapid Transit, cancel Waterloo Region LRT. That that's the plan, Mr. Speaker, the and that DC is plan. absolutely DC unacceptable plan. to us. We believe that investing in the region, investing in the province, Mr. Speaker, making sure that communities across this region and across the province have the infrastructure, including transit, that they need in order for economic growth, we believe that those investments are critical. And I am, you know, Answer. I'm not going to suggest that it is easy for a government to make these long-term investments, Mr. Speaker. But if we don't, then we're abdicating our Thank responsibility you. You to future generations. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, I guess we're going to have to have another meeting. I know I tried to sometimes with a lot of meetings and conversations, but I've laid out this plan over a year ago. You and I have talked about it on several occasions. You sure the environment come to order. Plan, but I think you're making a big mistake in increasing taxes on families, particularly commuters here in the greater Toronto area. Your plan, according to the Golden Commission, is to increase gas Mr. taxes. Mr. Training College and Universities, and come to order. So, let, and our plan is to build subways. I think that is what world-class cities do, and expand highway capacity. I'll keep talking about it. I've been talking about it for some time now as leader. But here's a question I have for you. Y you've done studies, and then you had a study of studies, and now the Golden Panel is effect effectively a study of a study of a study. So th this is your final decision, right? You're not calling a friend here. This is the final call. Your plan is to increase gas taxes by five cents a litre, or are you just kicking this down the road for another study? Here's the difference. Leaders make decisions. Question. I've got my plan. I'm ready to go. It'll build subways, expand highways. It'll create jobs in the province of Ontario. Is this your Thank plan? You. Yes or no? I got mine. Thank you. I'm ready to go. Yeah. 
Be seated, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, <laughs> the, it, it's it's almost laughable. I'm trying not to, but Mr. Speaker, it's almost laughable that the notion that an unfunded plan that would cancel the projects that I listed in Hamilton, Mississauga, York Region, Waterloo Region, that that is somehow, Mr. Speaker, a plan transit. that would help transit that, and would help the people in this region and beyond who are sitting in traffic, Mr. Speaker, businesses that are trying to move their goods around. The the reality is that we have to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. We are determined to do that. We've said all along that we would put the plan into the, uh, the 2014 budget. That is the target that we are uh, on, Mr. Speaker. I hope that the Leader of the Opposition will read the Ann Golden Report. I hope even more, though, Mr. Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition understands that if we abdicate this responsibility Answer. now and we do not make investments in transit, then future generations will look back and say, what were you thinking? Why Thank were you, you not making the investments? That we need it in you. order for this. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Um, Premier, I think people will listen to you here today and they'll say that, you know, you said you're going to increase hydro rates by 60%. Your energy minister famously said, don't worry about the gas plant waste, that's only a cup of coffee. Yep. And now you're going to increase taxes by five cents a litre on gas? Oh. They're going to say, what are you thinking? Exactly. And exactly. who are you talking to? This oh, makes no sense. We've laid out a plan that will actually invest in subways to go underground to build world-class cities, expand highway capacity, and set up an Ontario Trillion Trust to fund that plan. Your plan is to increase taxes, to waste more money. And, and I, let me ask you this, too, because I'm not sure if this is your plan or another study of a study that will be followed by another study. But I see a member from St. Catharines wow. gave the gas tax a standing ovation. I see a member from Peterborough gave the gas tax a standing ovation. Let me understand this to be clear. Are you going to increase Question. gas taxes in Peterborough, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls to fund subway expansion in Toronto? Is that actually your plan? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, I ask the, uh, ask the Leader of the Opposition to read the report when, it is, uh, when it's released today, Mr. Speaker. But the member from Renfrew, no, Nipissing, Pembroke, Pembroke, come to order. The fact is that the Leader of the Opposition can diminish the process of actually talking to people who understand how transit works and where it needs to be built, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition can grab onto a populist notion that building subways everywhere, Mr. Prince Speaker, Edward is Hastings the answer. That's not the case. The, mem the Leader of the Opposition can say that he has a plan to build transit when there is no funding apparent, Mr. Speaker. He has, had, he has made no funding announcements except, Mr. Speaker, to say that he will slash services, that he will cut thousands of thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker, in order to slash services across government, as he did as part of the previous cabinet, Mr. Speaker. So there is no credibility, Mr. Speaker, to the notion that he is putting forward. We are determined to invest in the infrastructure, including transit, that is needed in order to grow this economy. And we Thank you. The Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I would like to begin by, uh, on behalf of New Democrats, wishing the uh, people of this province, the members, all of the staff of the precinct, yourself, Speaker, uh, a very uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. It's going to be a, a wonderful season, and I uh, hope that everyone enjoys it. Speaker, I also want to, on behalf of uh, New Democrats, uh, uh, acknowledge a member who won't be joining us uh, in the future here, who it's, it, for whom it's his last day, and that's the member for Thornhill. Uh, the member for Thornhill has served this legislature well for his constituents. He has, uh, he has been passionate. We haven't always agreed, uh, that's for sure, uh, but he did some heavy lifting for the Conservative caucus as their finance critic. Uh, he, has, uh, he has worked very, very hard for a number of years here. Uh, uh, and he deserves our thanks and our, uh, our respect as he leaves this place. Uh, he was passionate, uh, he was committed to the work he was doing, and his radio voice will be uh, well missed in this chamber. Speaker, I, uh, I would like to uh, put my first question to the Premier. 
Ten years ago, the Premier was elected as part of a Liberal team that insisted that the scandalous perks, bonuses and high salaries that drove up hydro uh, bills were a failure of leadership and that they would, quote, never be repeated. Why has nothing changed, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to reinforce the, uh, what the leader of the uh, third party said about the member for Thornhill and thank him for his service. Thank you very much. Here, here. And as I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, um, the, the culture at OPG uh, clearly has been resistant to change, and uh, that has been through subsequent governments, Mr. Speaker. Government after government has made changes. Those changes have not created the kind of uh, culture that we think is appropriate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are going to put in place controls that would, have, uh, would give government some direct authority on the compensation, Mr. Speaker, at, uh, at OPG. And that, Mr. Speaker, is something that has not been done by governments before, but clearly it is what is needed, and that is what we are going to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier insists that she's taking the latest scandals at the OPG seriously, but where have the Liberals been for the last decade? That's right. They paid lip service, Speaker. They paid lip service to reining in high, sky high salaries, yet done nothing at all about it. Meanwhile, everyday Ontarians are paying the price through their hydro bills for Liberal inaction. Will the Premier admit today that the failure of leadership is in the Premier's office? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, no, because the, the fact is that this is a situation that has, uh, has persisted over a number of governments, Mr. Speaker. We did make changes. We did make changes as a government previously. We made those changes. But, Mr. Speaker, the culture persisted, as it did under the Conservatives and as it did under the NDP, Mr. Speaker. So what I'm saying is we need to put in place government controls that are direct controls on compensation because the culture seems seems to be resistant to the other changes that have been made, and the culture has been resistant, whether it's been a Conservative government, an NDP government, or a Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. So we're going to make the changes that are necessary in order for government to have those controls over those compensation packages. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, the fact is people feeling squeezed harder and harder than ever by lost jobs, shrinking paychecks, have heard this government promise over and over that things will change. And they see the same old story being played over and over and over again. They pay the bills. Well-connected insiders get the millions. The Premier is blaming people and pointing fingers everywhere she can, but she's refusing to admit one simple fact. The buck stops with her. Right. At what point? At what point, Speaker? Does the Premier stop looking around for people to blame, show some leadership, and admit that the Liberals have simply failed to respect the people of Ontario's money? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the uh, leader of the uh, third party refers to the 10-year period. The audit was over a 10-year period. However, Mr. Speaker, there has been a business transformation plan underway at OPG, and it's important to note that over the last three years, OPG has undergone a significant transformation. 1,500 full-time employees have already been eliminated. The goal is to reduce the number of staff by another 800 employees, going from 11,640 in 2011 to 9,308 by 2016. Uh, making a total reduction of 2,300 full-time employees, Mr. Speaker. In addition, under the, the 2007 Agency Review Panel, uh, OPG's executive salaries were reduced by 25 to 30 percent. Yes, sir. New contracts, and uh, also, Mr. Speaker, the members should be aware of the fact that over the last eight years, OPG has generated seven billion dollars yep. bottom line transferred. Yes, Fred. No question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, imagine how much they would have generated had they not been pulling down those uh, exorbitant salaries. Uh, speaker, my, uh, my next question is for the Premier. People are feeling squeezed more than ever by jo job losses and higher bills. They've been asked to make sacrifices after sacrifices in tough times. They're paying more in HST, more in hydro bills, even while jobs are being lost and paychecks simply aren't keeping up. Does the Premier think it's fair to ask them to pay more in a gasoline tax? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I have to 
say, Mr. Speaker, I would expect these questions from the Conservative caucus, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. I would expect these questions from the Leader of the Opposition. But from a party that apparently is progressive, Mr. Speaker, that, that puts itself out as a, as a party that believes in the, in the environment, protecting the environment, believes in public transit, Mr. Speaker, I really find it strange that the leader of the third party does not seem to grasp that if we do not invest in transit, if we do not make those difficult decisions to invest in infrastructure and create a transit network that will work for the region and beyond, if we don't do that, Mr. Speaker, then we are abdicating our responsibility. So I have to say to the leader of the third party, I am very, very surprised, given the number of members that you have, Answer. I know are environmentalists yeah, who right, I know right, believe okay. in transit that you would pose that question to me. You see the please? You see the please? I, uh, I'm uh, going to ask the Attorney General that when the Premier is answering that he not interject, and I'm also going to ask the member from Hamilton Mountain to uh, come to order. Supplementary, please. Speaker, families feel like they're being stretched to the breaking point. That's what New Democrats believe because that's what we hear every day when we go back to our ridings. But while they pay more and more, they don't see others sharing the same sacrifice. They've been told to pay higher hydro bills, to pay an HST on gasoline and home eating, and sacrifice services that they rely on, but they've watched as the Premier has let hydro CEOs collect million-dollar bonuses and plow ahead with tax loopholes for Ontario's richest corporations. It's a simple question, Speaker. Does the Premier think it's fair to ask these same families to pay more? more yet again. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Families are... You see it, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Families are stretched. They are stretched, and part of the reason they're stretched, Mr. Speaker, is that they don't have the public transit services that they need. So I would ask the leader of the third party to talk to the member from Kitchener-Waterloo, to talk to the member for Beaches East York, to talk to the member for Toronto Danforth, to talk to the member for Trinity Spadina, Parkdale High Park, Mr. Speaker, for Stony Creek. Ask your whole caucus, Mr. Speaker, whether they have constituents who want to see investments in infrastructure, who want to see investments in transit, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, because the quality of life that people have to deal with, Mr. Speaker, when they're sitting in gridlock, when they don't have access to the transit that they need, is not what we, we think is acceptable. So, if we do not, if we do not make those investments, Mr. Speaker, if we do not have a coherent transit plan going forward, as the third party does not have, Mr. Speaker, then we are abdicating our responsibility. We're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to invest in transit. The Premier needs to talk to the single mom in Scarborough who can't pay her bills today. That's what the Premier needs to talk to. The people who make Ontario work have heard promises of change for a decade, but they've seen the same old Liberals offering the same old priorities. People are paying the highest hydro bills in Canada, while hydro CEOs collect million-dollar bonuses. People are paying new unfair sales taxes and fees, while the government plows ahead with, a new, with new tax loopholes for corporations. Can the Premier make it clear today? Right now, will she be asking families to pay more yet again with a new gasoline tax? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. A single mom in Scarborough doesn't want to spend two hours to get downtown, Mr. Speaker. A single mom in Scarborough wants to be able to pick up her child at daycare and get her to school. A single mom in Scarborough wants to be able to take a subway, Mr. Speaker. So, we are going to invest in transit, Mr. Speaker, exactly because the families in this region need that support, Mr. Speaker. And as I say, I understand these questions coming from the Conservatives. They've never believed in transit, Mr. Speaker. But I think it is shocking that the third party does not have.
start the clock. New question? The member from Public Elections. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Pre Premier, I I'm, a little, I'm a little confused about the revenue tools. Sometimes you use them and sometimes you don't use them. Like sometimes you need them and sometimes you don't need them. And I, I can't figure out when those times are. When you implemented Aldi Kindergarten for a billion and a half a year, you did not need revenue tools. When you paid off the Liberal fiascos like the gas plants and uh, e-health and orange and the overspending at OPG, you did not need revenue tools. But now, all of a sudden, people want transit and you need revenue tools. Now, I don't understand why in this situation you need the revenue tools. What I want to know, Premier, is this for financial reasons or environmental reasons, and why now? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you, Brown. <laughs> Minister of Transportation. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is hysterically funny. The member opposite, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, voted for a tax increase every year. I get a 2% property tax increase. When I was a mayor, I cut taxes. He voted for tax increases. Mr. Speaker, the place which he comes from and the, and the leader he used to follow, an interesting personality, Mr. Speaker, even Mayor Ford has increased taxes and is proposing a compounding tax. When the member did not vote for taxes, what did he do? He cancelled the subway in Etobicoke. So he tells his own truth, Mr. Speaker. Yet when he voted for tax increases, he got subways. When he didn't vote for tax increases, Mr. Speaker, he cancelled subways. The Tories are doing it again. Seated, please. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Supplementary. I do. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Premier, the, the, the motorists in Toronto and Hamilton are already contributing more than their share to, to the uh, transportation costs of the province of Ontario. I've had that information given me by the CAA and others. And now you're wanting to add more costs to those people already. Now, I, I don't think that's fair, but, but maybe you do. She does. Um, well, the Minister we'll of Community it, and we'll Social it, Services we'll come to order. Priorities. We will take. We will take the small portion that's needed out of the overall cost of, of the budget, and find and just we'll fund it the same way you funded all day kindergarten. But what I want to know, Premier, is before you implement this new tax, this new plan, will you go to the public and let the electorate have a say first? <laughs> Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know, I've owned a business and run a business, uh, and I think it's important on this side of the House we try to take a broader perspective. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when, uh, when the member opposite looks at a household budget, he should talk to the member from from uh, from 
from Caledon, Mr. Speaker, because you know there you have four or five cars. If you actually, because you have no transit in your neighborhood, have to have a beater for your 16-year-old or a beater for your 17-year-old, that's seven to eleven thousand dollars per child to get them to school. And there are too many families in the 905, Mr. Speaker, who have three or four or five cars. Some of them are 10 or 15 years old. That's pretty expensive on the household budget. I will give you one hint about what's in the Golden Report, Mr. Uh, Mr. Answer. Speaker. One of the things that she will tell you is that the average commuter right now spends $700 more burning gas with their car not moving. Nothing Thank in her you. proposal costs a person more than that. Thank you. New question, the member from Brandon Lee, Gordon Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, in 2010, New Democrats asked a very simple question. What was Dr. Mazza's salary? That was our simple question. Three years later, we are still asking the very same question. The minister can provide us with every excuse in the books about why she didn't know. But the fact of the matter is, tracking his salary and the financial structure of Orange is the responsibility of this minister, is her job. Now we can see that for the brief time that Orange was reporting their salaries to the Sunshine List, that those numbers are inaccurate. Will the minister simply admit that she failed to provide the oversight necessary? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, I have to say this is a very bizarre question. And let me tell you why it's a bizarre question. Because the, the MPP from Guelph, when she was on committee, requested, because we all wanted clarity, she requested all compensation paid to Dr. Mazza over a period of six years, I believe. That information was tabled with the clerk of the committee over a year ago. Members have had access to that information for many, many months, Speaker, and they simply haven't read it. So the bizarre question is going to get a straight answer. You've got all the information you've asked for, and today committee members received a summary of that because that was asked for uh, as well, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, what's bizarre is that the Minister of Health would receive a report, a forensic audit, and not read it. That, to me, is bizarre. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the forensic audit lays out a litany of disturbing facts. Details of personal loans that Mazza was given, the web of companies whose primary purpose was to shield executive salaries, and the sheer excess of money that was given to a select few. The fact that two years into the investigation of Orange, new details and disturbing, disturbing facts are still surfacing means that Ontarians are asking the question, has anything changed? Speaker, it seems that this minister has done nothing to ensure that the root cause of this problem, which was salary disclosure, the Sunshine List, is accurate. She has done nothing to prove that the oversight has improved. She continues to leave out important details in the hope that this sad scandal will simply go away. How can the minister assure Question. Ontarians that another orange won't happen again, given her inability to learn from her mistakes? Um, a speaker, again, this is very strange coming from a man who's had documents and apparently has not read them. Speaker, it took only one year of Chris Maz's salary to give me all the information I needed to take swift action, Speaker. I called in the, uh, an, a forensic audit team, Speaker. That forensic audit team reported a few weeks later, and the findings of that forensic audit team were so shocking that it was immediately referred to the Ontario Provincial Police. That's where it should have gone, Speaker. If I had to make the same decision over again, it's exactly the decision that would have been made, Speaker. I have been nothing but upfront that all of the information that the committee has requested has been there for months and months. Answer. Thank you. Question, the member from the Tobacco North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Education, Honourable Lissant. The government believes in creating a more prosperous and just society, and that means empowering people by investing in education. Our government has made consistent and persistent investments, upgrades in capital projects so that our children get the best education available in the English-speaking world. Our kids need such quality education in order to compete for the high-skilled jobs of tomorrow's economy. 
In uncertain times, I believe it is to every citizen's advantage if they have a government build a strong future for Ontarians. As example, Speaker, graduation rates are up 15 points from 2003 to 83% this year, and overall, 71% of students are achieving the provincial standard in grades three and six combined, up 17 points from 54% a decade ago. Speaker, can the minister please inform this chamber? How do the results we are Question. seeing here in Ontario compare to other jurisdictions around the world? Minister of Education. And delivered. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member from Etobicoke North for raising this issue. And I must say that our educators, our teachers, their parents deserve a tremendous amount of credit for the success that we've had in our schools. And I'm pleased to share the latest results for the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, which is conducted by the OECD. The results were released last week, and they've again ranked Ontario students as some of the best in the world. The results prove that the investments that we're making in our students in our schools are making a difference. In fact, both Canada and Ontario perform significantly higher than 48 other jurisdictions on the paper-based math assessment. Ontario performed above the OECD average Answer. in math, science and reading. Like most other ju ju jurisdictions across Canada, however, we know we have more work Thank to you. do on math, and that's Thank why you. math is. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister Standles, for your stewardship of this essential file, which ultimately will determine our children's and Ontario's future. When I tour my own riding, Speaker, and the schools of Etobicoke North, I can see the results and the on-the-ground analogues of the acknowledgments and success in virtual cycles that Ontario has cultivated. But following the mantra of our government, while we have seen great progress over the last 10 years, there is, as the minister has just said, more work to be done. Speaker, I know you have been engaged with our partners in education. Minister, I know you've been engaged with our partners in education, businesses, students, and parents on the next phase of our education system. So can you please inform this House what are some of the elements for success that you envision for the education system in the years ahead? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. And we've had great success with programs that involve experiential learning with our secondary students. For example, uh, the specialist high skills major, the dual credits, expanded opportunities for co op education have all helped with the increase in secondary school graduation rates, and we will carry on with those. We're also embracing 21st century learning with a focus on creative and critical things thinking as we move forward by making better use of technology and digital resources to engage students and enhance their skills. And in fact, on the PISA results, we began to see that showing up already. When you looked at the PISA had a subset where they had a computer-based test as opposed to a, a paper-based. And on the computer-based test, Ontario students did extraordinarily yes, well. So we can see that move into more technology-based learning beginning to pay off with Thank the you. students who are writing the tests now. Thank you. Your question, the member from the PM Carlson. Is to the Premier. Uh, Premier, on Tuesday we learned that there was massive mismanagement at the OPG, but we learned in 2011 that there were real problems at the OPG through a report by the OEB, the Ontario Energy Board. The environment. They told this government that massive increases to salaries and to pensions and benefits were showing up on people's from rates, Sudbury, and come that's why they denied them a full rate increase. You knew then, you knew in 2013, just last week when the auditor came out, that this was a systemic problem with that board of directors, with that management team, and with your minister. You have one option left. You have to fire the three of them, the minister, the chair, and the CEO. Will you do it, yes or no? Um, member from Oxford, those are uh, expensive desks. Premier? 
Mr. Speaker, uh, I do want to take the opposition to uh, wish uh, the compliments of the season to my uh, official critic. Uh, our ridings are neighbouring ridings, Mr. Speaker, and uh, she is my constituent and I'm her constituent, Mr. Speaker. What a so, uh, relationship! We have, we have a wonderful working relationship. And uh, I do want to answer the question, though, Mr. Speaker, uh, and that is, uh, I mentioned earlier in response to the leader of the third party, that uh, there was a business transformation that started exactly in 2011, Mr. Speaker, which has already resulted in 1,500 full-time employees eliminated, uh, 800 more on the way, Mr. Speaker, over the next year or two. Uh, that's significant progress. In addition, in 2007, under the agency review panel, Mr. Speaker, OPG's executive salaries were reduced by 25 oh, Member from Halton, come to order. Executive contracts. Or from Leeds, come to order. Has decreased by 9% since 2010, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks. Uh, back to the Premier because I didn't receive an answer on whether or not she would fire the head of the OPG, the chair of the OPG, and the minister. And while the minister may have uh, me as a constituent and I have him, I can say that there's one MPP of the two ridings that's actually providing re reasonable re leadership to the people of this province, and it is Tim Hudak's MPP, not Kathleen Wynne's. So, Speaker, I will stand here in my place and I will ask the Premier of Ontario one final thing. Will she direct the OEB to pull the rate increase that is being asked of the OPG this year and will she ensure that ratepayers are not on the hook anymore for handsome salaries, big bonus and lavish pensions that her government has authorized? Yes or no, will she fire them and will she make sure that that stops now? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, sometimes the outrage is really outrageous, Mr. Speaker. But uh, I, I have to say that uh, she keeps referring to uh, the price of electricity, uh, and her leader, her leader, Mr. Speaker, has agreed that he has no answer on that. Because when the leader of the opposition was asked if he could promise lower electricity rates, he said the answer is no to that. He has no policy whatsoever, Mr. Speaker. The only policy he has is a white paper to privatize OPG. And in privatizing OPG, we know what the Toronto Sun has said about that, that Mr. Speaker. Uh, they did that, tried that once before, Mr. Speaker, and instead it led to the exact opposite. Rates skyrocketed amid rampant Tory patronage, and the Conservatives, faced with rising public fury, abandoned the scheme, leaving a financial disaster in their wake. They still have a financial disaster, Mr. Speaker. They have no plan whatsoever. How are they going to govern without having a plan before the people of Ontario? Thank you. Question. We're from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. The question to the Premier. Yesterday, this government made it official. The dream of creating 50,000 green energy jobs was, was officially buried in the fine print of its new energy legislation. Quebec is protecting its green jobs. Can you explain why Quebec figured out how to protect its green jobs and you can't? Mr. Premier, Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, coincidentally, about three days ago, Quebec announced uh, its new electricity rate, and it's going up by 5.8 percent. Wow. Mr. Speaker, our long-term energy plan. Why you give us that? Story? Our long-term energy plan will have 50 percent renewables by 2025. Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to invest in clean energy. We are continuing to take significant steps, Mr. Speaker, to push price pressure down. One of that is by taking $15 billion out of the cost base by indefinitely deferring new nuclear, Mr. Speaker. They still haven't said yes, they agree with eliminating new nuclear. I'd like to hear the word yes from the NDP. Yes, 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 you agree with taking $15 billion of cost pressure yes, out of the system. Supplementary. Evasion by the government is not a compliment. It is not a uh, strategy that the people of Ontario want. This government could have created those promised jobs and delivered green energy at lower prices. It didn't. Quebec has gotten it right. Not only are the prices paid to Quebec's green energy generators lower than Ontario's, but they've stayed on the right side of international law. Will this government follow the lead of Quebec and protect Ontario's green jobs? Minister. 
guys vote behind the table. Mr. Speaker, they did not support the Green Energy Act. Mr. Speaker, they have no policy on renewables. They have no policy on clean energy. Where is it? Show it to the people of Ontario. Just like your leader, Mr. Critic, you have no policy in any way, shape, or form. You are a disgrace to your NDP base. They like renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. They like our decision on nuclear, and they are telling us by emails and phone calls that they like what we're doing with clean energy, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Be seated. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I'm pleased to attend the House today representing my riding of Ottawa Orleans. My riding, like so many others in Ontario, has a diverse population with diverse needs. But one thing that everyone in this province needs at some point is their life, in their life is high-quality health care. One of the chief goals of this government's action plan for health care is for the right care to be delivered, delivered in the right place for families in Orleans. That means a facility providing excellent care in our community of over 100,000 people. Can the minister please provide this house with an update on the proposed Orleans Health Hub? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, and thank you to the member from Ottawa, Orleans, for uh, this question and also for his continued and passionate advocacy on this and other issues, Speaker. I know the member has been fighting for a health hub in Orleans uh, for quite some time now. The people of Ottawa Orleans know they have a strong champion in this House for their health care needs, and I know that the Orleans Family Health Hub will be an important part of this member's legacy. I'm pleased to tell the House and, uh, and the people of Ottawa Orleans uh, today that we continue to make progress on the Orleans Health Hub. We made this an important commitment as part of our Building Together Plan in 2011, and since then, the Champlain Lynn has submitted a Stage 1 submission for the first phase of the Health Hub. Now, local health care and community leaders are working together with the Lynn to move this project forward. When complete, the Orleans yes, Family Health Hub will provide comprehensive primary care to thousands of East Enders. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister and uh, Speaker. Through you, I'm sure that families in my riding will be happy to hear that the Orleans Family Health Hub remains a priority for this government. In the meantime, families across my riding still need access to timely, high-quality care. Expectant moms, families with young children, and folks entering their sunset years, people can experience health challenges at any stage of their life, and they need to know that the care they need will be there when they need it. Through you, Speaker, could the minister please speak about what other investments she's making in Ottawa's health care? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, there's no question we've made strong investments in Ottawa, uh, right for all people of all ages, starting uh, with newborns and uh, uh, right through end of life. I was recently delighted to announce that the new midwife-led Ottawa Birth and Wellness Centre will soon begin welcoming patients. When fully up and running, the birth, uh, the birth centre will assist with about 450 births a year. Increasing access to primary care has been a priority for our government since day one. Our recruitment and training efforts have attracted more than 550 additional doctors to the Ottawa area. That's a 25 per cent increase oh an, since 2003, an and 10 family what health teams are providing care to almost uh, uh, 140,000 people in the region. Answer. And also, Speaker, more than 900 long-term care beds have been or are being built or redeveloped, including 160 redeveloped beds at Madonna Nursing Home in Orleans. Thank we'll you. Continue to make the. Thank you. New no question, the member from York Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Minister, this week the ruling that allowed the appeal of convicted killer Michael Rafferty revealed that either Legal Aid Ontario or your ministry will assume the cost of Rafferty's upcoming appeal. Why? People in my riding in Ontario are outraged about this, and rightfully so. Sure it is offensive that their tax dollars will pay for the appeal of a convicted child killer. What's more is that he began his appeal shortly after his conviction and continued to appeal until he found a sympathetic judge. While his abil ability to appeal is an endless, costly process for taxpayers, the real cost is the emotional burden for his victims. I ask, Question. do you believe this is justice? Well, 
Attorney General. Well, I do appreciate this question, and I realize full well that uh, there's a tremendous amount of emotion involved, particularly uh, on behalf of the victim. But the member should be aware that Section 684 of the Criminal Code, which Chris passed by the federal parliament, federal. The, fed, the federal code, uh, the Criminal Code, si Section 684 of the Criminal Code permits a judge at the Court of Appeal to appoint counsel. And if the judge thinks it's in the interest of justice for a person to have a lawyer, and that person cannot afford one. So it was an order of the judge in accordance with the provisions oh, of the okay. criminal code. Now, in this particular case, if Legal Aid Ontario further refuses to fund the counsel for the appellant, and that's up to Legal Aid Ontario, then the Court of Appeal has ordered uh, that those fees and disbursements must be paid Federal by court. the Ministry of the Attorney General. That is the status Answer. that the member has an issue with respect to that. Maybe she should talk to her federal counterparts to change the provisions right. in the criminal right. code. Thank you. Minister, it's so hard for victims of crime to deal with the horrors that they've experienced, and we make it a great deal more difficult when a man who is clearly guilty of this crime can utilize tax dollars to fight the case. How do I explain to my constituents? You guys just don't understand what well, Speaker, uh, I have some great sympathy, sympathy with respect to how to explain this to the, to the general public. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, is warned. Speaker, I quite well understand that it may be very difficult to explain this to the general public, and obviously it's a very emotional issue for all the parties involved, particularly those that have been victimized as a result of the offense. But the reality is that Mr. it's up to a judge come to order. who's part of an independent judiciary to determine whether or not he or she wants to apply Section 684 of the Criminal Code. If there are issues with respect to that, then I think that representation should be made to the federal government to change the Criminal Code in that regard. In the meantime, in the meantime we respect the independence of the judiciary. This has been ordered in this particular case. The matter has been referred to Legal Aid Ontario. Depending upon Thank what you. they do, the Ministry of the Attorney General may or may not be. See you, please. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Fort Erie racetrack officials produced a detailed proposal to build a racing festival around the Chinese calendar's Year of the Horse. The Premier should be aware of the proposal because it was hand delivered to her. After this government removed the slots from Fort Erie and ignored this racetrack in their recent announcement of support for other racetracks, Fort Erie racetrack officials were told to come up with and submit a plan. Well, they've done that. Chinese New Year's is January 31st. There is some real urgency here. Will this government support Fort Erie's proposal for the Year of the Horse Festival plan? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I am aware of the plan, and I, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to meet with one of the people who is very interested in uh, advancing this plan. And in fact, exactly what I said needed to happen is happening, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker. The people who are interested in Fort Erie uh, continuing and being sustained uh, are getting together, and they have put together a plan. There's a meeting on Tuesday with the ORC and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, and John Snowblen will be at that meeting to look at the plan, Mr. Speaker. So exactly what I said a number of weeks ago should happen is happening, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what's not happening is a speedy decision. Every day that this government delays, the horse racing infrastructure around Fort Erie diminishes as farms are sold off and people involved in horse racing move away. The government needs to act now if there is going to be racing in Fort Erie next year. Instead of responding to the Fort Erie Festival proposal, the Premier's office, in fact, sent an email out to media in Niagara saying the government wants them produced to produce yet another another long-term business plan. This racetrack has produced business plan after business plan after business plan. This government is burying them with paperwork and doesn't seem to get the urgency of the situation. Will the Premier look seriously at this proposal and respond before December 31st to the 40-year year of the horse Question. festival plan? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So there's an idea. 
I think it's an interesting idea, Mr. Speaker, but there does need to be a business plan. The fact is that uh, the work is not finished yet, and so that work needs to be finished. As I said, there's a meeting happening on Tuesday. And, Mr. Speaker, my ministry, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Food, will do everything we can to support the development uh, of a business plan, to support folks, but they are going to have to complete a business plan. It would be irresponsible, Mr. Speaker, for there to be no business plan and for government to, uh, or for the ORC to adopt that plan. So we just want to see a business plan, Mr. Speaker. The process is in place, and as I said, what we what we thought should happen is exactly what is happening. And I'm very pleased that this idea has come forward, and I hope that the Answer. business plan will be produced. New question, the member from Oldfield. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, today we find that too many new and young workers are unaware of the safety concerns that apply to their own jobs. We find that the accident and the injury rates among new and young workers remain persistently higher of those older and more experienced workers. Now, as a government, I think we all agree we need to do more to ensure that our new and young workers are safe when they go to work in the morning. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is the Ministry of Labour doing to ensure that all workers get the proper training and the tools they need so they can, they can stay safe on the jobs they're working at. Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Oakville for asking a very important question, an issue that should be uh, very near and dear to everyone's heart in this legislature and around the province, Speaker. It is extremely important uh, that uh, when people uh, everyone, that when they go to work, Speaker, they return home back to their, uh, to their loved one and to their families. And that's why, Speaker, uh, we're really proud that uh, our government has undertaken uh, one of the largest transformation of our health and safety uh, rules and regulations in over 30 years. We'll be making prevention the number one criteria to ensure that our workplaces are safe. And as a result of the, the uh, expert panel's report led by Mr. Tony Dean, uh, we are in the process of implementing all the recommendations that he outlined. And Sir? one of those key implementations was to have mandatory awareness training for all, uh, for all uh, workers and supervisors. Speaker, starting July 1, 2014, that training will be in place. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm sure the parents and I'm sure that the young people them, themselves will be very glad to hear of the new initiatives that are being taken to protect young Ontarians, including those on their first jobs. Now, the major change to how we to do business is going to require some time, it's going to require extra information, it's going to require conversations with business in order to be implemented in a proper way, and I know that business wants to be our partner in this regard. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, how will the Ministry ensure that employers and businesses have adequate time, they've got the right information, so they can adjust and prepare for this new mandatory training? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, Speaker, as I mentioned, the mandatory awareness training for all workers and supervisors come into place on July 1st of 2014. Uh, in the meantime, we are making sure that uh, workers and employers know what their obligations are. The information for, for that requirement is already out there. You can get the work for, uh, workbooks for free from Service Ontario, as well as uh, you can do it online at ontario.ca slash uh, labor. Speaker, we're also working in making sure that we've got uh, mobile-enabled uh, apps as well uh, for, for workers so that you can download it. We're making sure that Remember we've got information Kitchener, Water, in, 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 order. in uh, nine different languages, uh, in, uh, plus English and French. We're making sure that we've got information available uh, for, uh, in, uh, low, for people with low literacy and also a speaker yes, for visually impaired. Uh, again, I ask businesses and workers to start that training now. Let's not wait, wait till July 1st, 2014. Thank and thank all the members for their support. For thank you. New question, the member from New Mark Lower. My uh, question is to the Premier. Speaker, uh, we have it on good authority that uh, the Premier and current and former ministers of this government are being haunted by their spirits of Christmas past. No. They're being reminded of their reckless and irresponsible decisions that wasted precious millions of health care dollars on Orange and eHealth, drove hydro bills through the roof, drove jobs out of the province, and gave us a have-not province. So are they Grinches? And they're being told that the only solution to peace in their lives is restitution. And the only restitution that there is, Speaker, is to bring an end to this government. And so will the Premier 
give the people of Ontario a gift this Christmas season? Will she give them a spring election? Seated, please. You seated, please. I'm just trying to. Premier. Speaker, well, <laughs> Scrooge is one of my favorite characters, Mr. Speaker. And what Scrooge did was he learned. He learned from those those ghosts of Christmas past, Mr. Speaker. And he then went on to focus on Christmases yet to come and to make sure that every child and every family in his circle, Mr. Speaker, the tiny Tim, had a future. And our <laughs> hard goal, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I didn't get the Tim thing there. But more specifically, Mr. Speaker, we want to make the investment yes, that will ensure that the people of Ontario have, br have a bright future, Mr. Speaker. Well, you see, Speaker, the Premier got one step ahead of me on the Tim part, part of this, <laughs> because where we were going with this is that if the Premier and her ministers want peace in their hearts, then she should give the people of Ontario an election so that Tim can in fact give the people of this province all of the things that they need. A strong economy, a good future, prosperity in the future. That's our request of the Premier. Premier, will you give the people of this province an election in the spring? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I appreciate the warmth and the goodwill in the, uh, the, the delivery of that question, Mr. Speaker. And what I will commit to this House is that, as I said during the leadership and as I have said for the last 10 months, we will continue to make this minority parliament work, Mr. Speaker. But if and when it's time to go to a general election, I am ready to do that, Mr. Speaker. But I believe our responsibility is to focus on the future, to make the investments in people and in infrastructure and a business climate that works. We would love to have the opposition work with us on Bill 105 so we could support small businesses in the province, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to those futures and working with the minority government. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. The member from uh, Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> My question this morning is to the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Good morning, Minister. Minister, we have another problem with the girders on the Herb Drake Parkway. President, that the company which built most of the deficient girders has not been paying its bills. Local suppliers, the little guys, have been hung out to dry. One company, in particular, is owed $116,387.64. The banks are calling several times a day. Let me borrow a couple of lines from the Premier's running commercial. I'll speak simply and get to the point. Will the Minister set as a goal to do everything in his power to see that these bills are paid Question. and paid today? Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. I, I, I want to uh, wish him not, not only good morning, but uh, Merry Christmas to uh, my friends. Uh, and uh, I also want to uh, thank all my critics. I think I have more than any other ministers. There's seven of you, but all of you. I wish you much joy, health, uh, and that. Um, and I will gladly answer the question uh, and, and wish you the Christmas spirit as well. Uh, we are working very hard on that right now. My colleague from Windsor West uh, and yourself 
Uh, we are looking at a number of remedies. There is a requirement now in the revised agreement that all of these companies must be current in their payments, uh, and I had suggested to you privately two or three approaches that we could take. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so I am quite optimistic we will do this. Most companies are being paid. Answer. There is one, co there is one company which is now in involved in some litigation as a result of it that has called it. A absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, it. Point of order from the Minister of Finance. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Point of order. On behalf of all small businesses in Ontario, our job creators, Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding Bill 105, an act to amend the employer health tax. The uh, Minister of Finance is seeking unanimous consent to move a motion without notice on Bill 105. Agreed. Do we agree? Agreed. I heard a no. I heard a no. The uh, leader of the third party on a... The... Excuse me. Excuse me. I, uh, I, uh, I, I will recognize the leader of the third party on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding, the, uh, regarding Nelson Mandela and the Toronto Transit Commission. The leader of the third party is seeking, unanim is seeking unanimous consent to move a motion without notice uh, regarding Nelson Mandana and the Toronto Transit Commission. Do we agree? Agreed. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. I move that should the Scarborough subway be extended, the Legislative Assembly recommend to the Board of Commissioners overseeing the Toronto Transit Commission that the first subway stop be named Nelson Mandela Station. Ms. Horvath moves that uh, should the Scarborough subway be extended, the Legislative Assembly recommended to the Board of Commissioners. I, uh, I would seek your uh, indulgence because uh, you'd like to hear this to ensure that you know what you're voting on. Recommend to the Board of Commissioners overseeing the Toronto Transit Commission that the first subway stop be named Nelson Mandela Station. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. I had the Minister of Northern Development and Mines on a point of order before. If I may, uh, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to use this opportunity to. Uh, thank everyone in the legislature for their very strong support that you all gave me over the last year as I was uh, my journey with cancer. I feel great and I uh, love you all and uh, I'm feeling wonderful. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Thank you. The Minister responsible for senior affairs on a point of order. Uh, speaker, on behalf of all the Ontario seniors, I want to wish you and every member of the House a very Merry Christmas, a Joyous Noel, and uh, a very happy holiday season, and the 2014 that will find us uh, all back here, uh, and we hope to have uh, uh, health, happiness, joy, and no election. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> I, uh, I do want to take a moment, uh, with your indulgence, to thank everyone uh, for the very, very hard work that they do. And contrary to what all of us know are said from time to time, I know that there will be a lot of work done in your constituency. Your, your tireless efforts are noticed, appreciated. On a personal note, um, if I were to be the person that was responsible for giving out lumps of coal. I would not do that to this group of people. I, it's, a, it's a fascinating one hour in our lives, and I wish all of you uh, a, a very Merry Christmas. 
season's greetings and thank you and for a healthy and prosperous new year. I appreciate that. The, the, member, the member from Timmins, James Bay, on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. In light of this uh, warmth that we now feel in this legislature, I would seek unanimous consent to move a motion in order to extend the sitting of the House until next week. We won't have any members on your side. The, mem <laughs> the member from Timmins, James Bay, is seeking unanimous consent to put a motion. Serious stuff. I have to do my job. Uh, the member from Timmins, James Bay, is seeking unanimous consent to put a motion without notice uh, regarding sitting. Do we agree? I did hear a no. There are no, for, there are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Sorry, I was in the middle of it. I don't stop.